Hey there, welcome to our cybersecurity seminar presented by Will um, Cawthorne. Before we get started, we want to just kind of run through some quick housekeeping rules. Um, you're encouraged to ask questions on the right hand side. You'll see station. feel free to to jump in, ask questions along the way and we'll answer as we can. Um, all questions are moderated, so they won't show in the general. They won't show until um, we post them from the moderator. Um, we'd love to know where everyone's viewing from. For, for, feel free to jump in. Do a shout out, type in uh, your, your city that you're from. The end of this, a recording of this will be posted on wheelhouseit.com slash resources. Um, again, that's wheelhouseit.com slash resources. And we'll all. Um, so let's jump into this. Uh, first, we're going to jump in with Ghani Zabersky, CEO of Wheelhouse IT. So, Ghani, take it away. Oh, thank you, Rory. Hello everyone, thank you guys for joining um, on this webinar. Um, uh, my name is Ghani. Um, I haven't done a webinar in a little while, so uh, um, uh, other people from our team usually handle this, so, so you guys have to bear with me a little rusty. Um, today we, um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, cyber liability and uh, cyber threats and what's going on in that landscape. Um, uh, first slide, I'm just going to kind of talk about who Wheelhouse IT is. Um, uh, sorry, okay, so so this is just a little bit about who Wheelhouse IT is. Um, we are a managed IT service provider. Um, we're based out of South Florida. Um, uh, we have certified security and compliance specialists on staff. Um, we have over 50 passionate, you know, individuals managing uh, networks. Um, uh, uh, majority of our clients are in the South Florida area, and then we also have an office in New York, uh, as well as an office in LA. New York would be our second largest location. Um, in general, we we um, we basically support and manage uh, small to, uh, small to mid-sized business environments. Um, we do a lot of Microsoft and security. Uh, we have four gold competencies with Microsoft. We're also Microsoft Southeast Partner of the Year uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and through that process, just we've been very busy and kind of transitioning a lot of businesses into kind of working remotely during COVID um, and. Uh, getting people to work remotely securely um, and uh, just just setting up a lot of modern office, modern workplace type, so, type of solutions, um, but um, you know, keeping a really strong focus in uh, cybersecurity. Um, okay, so um, on this first slide, um, uh, we're, this basically shows the, um, the cost worldwide of uh, cyber crime related crimes. I know that number seems extremely, extremely high. Um, this kind of aggregates just everything that's going on in the world in terms of cyber crime across all different industries, all different types of attacks from ransomware to phishing, phishing and all the costs associated with, with um, the repercussions of those attacks. Um, and um, this is kind of a prediction on 2021 at six trillion. Um, we'll be talking about the increases that we've seen since COVID. So I don't know if that number is going to change. Hopefully it doesn't go up, um, but we've definitely seen an increase since COVID and we'll talk about those increases. Um, so so um, I'm actually going to pass this one off to Kevin. Hello, this is uh, Kevin Purvis with Cotham Risk. We do uh, insurance for technology firms, life science firms, and other businesses. And since March, one of our specialty insurers, as well as a uh, uh, coalition, as well as other major insurers such as Chubb and Travelers, have all indicated they've seen a five times increase in claims in cyber losses. With some of the biggest and most common issues being funds transfer fraud, when someone uses social engineering techniques and manages to take money out of your bank account and wire it to somewhere else. And those claims have been coming in anywhere from as low as 25,000 to as high as 1.3 million. So there's definitely been a dramatic uptick in cybercrime since COVID-19 started. It's, it's a changing dynamic, and this is being driven by the amount of employees that are now working remotely from home and the change in procedures and operations. And, and so Ghani is going to get into a little bit more of that about how working remotely is impacting these uh, cybercrime and the ability to go out there and, and wreak havoc on businesses. 
Right. Thank you, Kevin. So yeah, um, uh, uh, Cotherm Risk and Wheelhouse have a long, long, long relationship going back. They also do our cyber liability, of course. We have a lot of mutual clients, so so um, sometimes we're we're dealing with the same client in in in, in a breach breach situation. But we have a uh, a lot going on in terms of post post breach clients, and of course we want to be dealing more with the pre breach clients. Of course, the ones that are you know working on improving their security. Um, Let's see here. Waiting for this slide to change. There we go. So working remotely. So, so um, we're all experiencing. I'm sure a lot of people on this call, m m uh, probably most, um, uh, are experiencing. You know, working remotely and the changes. It kind of happened abrupt. Uh, uh, the change. Uh, I, I remember in like the beginning of March, there was some talk, or maybe the end of February, the the possibility of businesses having to work remotely and. You know, who would have thought four months later we're still here, right? So um, the home setups are definitely uh, more insecure uh, just for so many different reasons. Um, you know, people started, uh, businesses didn't really have a work from home policy. So a lot of people just, they sent their employees home and did the best they can to kind of, you know, get set up. Um, whether it was a business with internal IT that didn't really have a plan for it or, or small IT companies that just, just weren't weren't equipped to help the businesses work from home. So so the employees just basically went home, used whatever computer they had to do whatever they could. Um, a lot of times, and and it wasn't just the employees; it was their kids too. You know, even, um, eight year old kids. Like I have an eight year old that all of a sudden needed a laptop, right? So so I was fortunately able to to you know get him a laptop. But a lot of a lot of home users had to just you know give their kids their their computers to use and share the computer so they can do virtual learning, which obviously, you know, um, brought more spyware, and more more issues onto those workstations at home. So, um, so just that that kind of sharing of that same workstation that people use for their business. Um, so um, uh, the the other parts is, um, you know. You get a you get some kind of phishing attack. You get an email. It's really easy to kind of you know walk down the hall and ask your director of finance, whoever it is. Hey, did you send me an email to wire you this money? That type of thing. Now everyone's disjointed. So the hackers understand that, right? The hacker. It's this giant industry. Um, you know they're making tons and tons of money um, in 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 these activities that they run. So they're not going to stop doing this. And when they see people, you know, working from home, they're just going to take advantage of that. So they're going to increase those phishing attacks. They're going to increase that social engineering. So, so we definitely want, you know, uh, you guys to be a, more on guard and just, just bring that awareness to, you know, to your employees that's just happening more and more. The other part is um, a lot of these businesses that weren't procuring, you know, laptops and computers for these home users because they weren't set up to work from home is the IT or the internal IT or the managed service provider isn't isn't truly allowed to take control of that workstation and take administrative control in order to secure it, right? So so because it's a huge privacy breach, right? So so I might be able to see all the financial data on the home computer and everything else when I when I have full control of that workstation. So it's a really tricky thing. And Wheelhouse has been working on many different ways to when businesses are using their home computers to work around that privacy breach to still be able to secure and support those home workstations without breaching the security of the or the privacy of those home users. So so just something to keep to, to keep in mind with 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 your home users if you are a home user or you manage any home users at your organization. So I want to talk a little bit about the the small to medium sized business. Um, that happens to be our most common client at Wheelhouse is the small to mid uh, market, which is you know up to about you know 500 employees and above. They are actually the low-hanging fruit. The reason that they're low-hanging fruit is small, small and mid-sized businesses, even a 10 or a 15 user environment, they don't realize that the records that they own are so valuable to hackers and the amount of money that the hackers can actually extract from them is, is, is so valuable to those hackers. And they know that those small businesses, they don't have security experts working in their business so those are the most vulnerable so so to them it's just low-hanging fruit i might not be you know the hacker might be thinking i might not be able to go and hack and get you know you know tens of millions of dollars from this large business but i might be able to get say a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars out of the small one by doing a ransomware and maybe selling the records on the black market so it's just happening constantly they say that most businesses have been breached at this point they just don't know it 
and and I would say at least half already uh, already know that they have been breached. So so um, the other part is that small businesses are also supply chains to the like the larger businesses as well. So so if there's a large business that they might support in some way, say a law firm or an accounting firm. Um, they are that supply chain. So, so if they can, they might not have to breach the large company. They might be able to breach the accounting firm or the law firm or or, or whatever it is of, of of that business or their supply chain, and they've actually gotten the data that they needed from that large business and indirectly. Um, so, um, I know this uh, is kind of a morbid analogy, but. Um, uh, we, we try to explain to businesses, especially in the healthcare environment, we do have a lot of healthcare clients and ones that have like patient health information, um, that getting breached is kind of like an atomic bomb, right? So, so let's take like the ransomware situation where, you know, a hacker was able to get into the network, encrypt all the data, um, lock down the network, right? So, so an atomic bomb is basically you have the explosion, right? Like in Hiroshima, there was the explosion. And then, you know, a couple days later, they got the acid rain that killed even more people. Um, and then the radiation obviously killed the most amount of people and the radiation even, even went through generations of people, right? So people are still affected by the bomb, by the bomb in Hiroshima. So, so when you get breached, it's kind of like the same concept. Like the first thing that people think about is the explosion, right? That first moment that they were that they were breached, that the that the hackers got in, they encrypted all the data. People couldn't use their server, they couldn't get to the data, and now they had to either you know restore from backup or work with the hackers to try to get their data back and pay their ransomware and do all that stuff. That's just the explosion, right? After that, now you have to deal with audits, and you know, especially say in the healthcare organization, or almost every organization at this point is regulated either by HIPAA or GDPR or or PCI or or one of those industries. Now, say on a, on the healthcare side or the PHI side or patient health information side, now they have to submit that to OCR if they have more than 600 patients in their database. Now that company needs to um, submit that to OCR, let them know that they've been breached. And now OCR, the government has to come in and start doing audits and finding out, well, what did you do? What did you not do? Is this your fault? And dealing with fines and dealing with all, 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 the, all the ramifications of that explosion. That's why we call that the acid rain. The radiation is the is the brand reputation that you lose, right? So, so I'll use the healthcare company, um, but it's all industries, right? So, let's say your healthcare company you've been breached. If you have more than six hundred patients in your database, now you have to send each one of them letters saying, "I've been breached." You know, um, your data your data has been accessed, and and um, and you might even you know OCR might even have you put something on your website letting them know that there's been a breach. So, so you can imagine what that can do to your brand reputation, but it, it's not really only the healthcare industry, all industries, you're a lawyer and you've been breached and, and now all your clients have been breached or accounting firm, insurance firm, whatever it is, right? So you, you definitely need to, um, you know, protect the data. Um, I'll go over to the next slide. Um, this is just ransomware alone. Um, ransomware just is, we're, we're just seeing more and more of it. Um, uh, I remember 10 years ago when I saw when when we saw the first ransomware incident when a you know a company called us up one day and said all their data was locked up. It was years and years ago. It was, you know, they were asking for you know a couple hundred dollars in Bitcoin. Um, now the Bitcoin ransomwares are you know tens of thousands of dollars. But of course that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, but um, and and if you can even get your money back, right, or get your data back, I'm sorry. So, so we've definitely seen an increase, and you can see that over the years. Um, you know, by Cybersecurity Ventures was the source that basically put this data in. Is is it's gone from 325 million to 5 billion, 11.5 billion in 2019. It's projected to be at 20 billion. I have a feeling that ransomware is going to go much higher than that, only because of COVID. Um, so this is this is basically the second part of what the hackers are going after. So yes, they want to lock up your data. They want to they want, want to put ransomware in your network. Um, but then what they do is they take all those records. So just because you know you've paid you've paid the hackers, let's say, or you got your data back, that doesn't mean that they didn't make a copy of your data, right? And the only way for you to know that they made a copy of your data is by having a software. We use a software specifically called Netrix that can show if data was actually copied or accessed. Um, but they can they can actually 
copy that data and you'll never know that they copied the data. Now, what do they do with that data? They go out to the black market. Now they might have email addresses and social security numbers and that type of stuff. Um, you, if you have clients in there and a social security number has been breached, they might have uh, breach alert detection through their credit card company or through their IT company or whatever it is. They might get an alert, find out that it was traced back to you. But basically what these hackers are doing is they're grabbing all that data, they're going to the dark web and they're, and they're submitting that data to be, to be resold. And that data could be resold many times over. And, and, and for the first seller, it could be you know, as high as $1,000 per record. Passports can be as high as, high as $2,000 per record, that type of thing. So now you can see as a small and medium-sized business might have tens of thousands of records, what the value of those records are on the black market or are on the dark web and why these hackers are just, just really trying to get that data. It's just a huge jackpot when they walk in and they just catch a database just full of records and they can just go to the black market and sell them very easily. Um, so this is just real quick, I wanna go through this and this is a great way, uh, great segue into Cawthorn is, is number one, you definitely gonna need, you're gonna want the protection, right? Um, so, so like for example, at Wheelhouse, there's just a specific baseline that we do in terms of security. Like you have to have firewalls, you have to have antivirus, any spyware, manager detection and response, multi-factor authentication, um, just a whole suite of products that we do to secure the network. Um, we can do have security analysts take a look at take a look at all the data being captured. Like we said, that Netrix product, just a bunch of different products that we put in into our managed services in order to protect small businesses. And, and so you need that protection layer, right? The other part is training. It's another thing that we offer as well as part of our managed services is, is what we call the human firewall, which um, you know users being trained on not to click on certain links, not to be socially engineered for phishing attacks or spear phishing attacks or whatever they are. Um, empowering those users to know, you know, do I click on this? Do I not click on this? So, so part, of, part of what we do at Wheelhouse is we kind of go through that training with them. We submit all the videos. We verify that people have watched and have taken the tests after those videos. And we also do simulated phishing to kind of show the business that you know this is this is a this is something that can happen. The other part is the recovery. Um, of course, you have to have disaster recovery. Uh, however, there's just so much cost involved in the recovery, and this is this is why we tell every single business that we talk to. It doesn't matter what we do to secure your network and to train your users, at some point, it's very possible you'll get breached. We will mitigate the possibilities of, of, of getting breached, but if someone really needs to get in the network and they're very highly skilled, sophisticated hackers, they're gonna get in, right? So you absolutely need cyber liability. The beauty of cyber liability is that it's very inexpensive. I believe it's going up rapidly now, right now because of COVID, but I don't, I don't specifically know if it's gone up yet, but you know, Kevin can talk about that, but it's a no brainer, right? It's such a low cost and you can bind it immediately. We actually tell businesses before we start, you can get, we can, you can have your insurance like almost instantly. It'll take us time to secure your network, right? But you can have your, your cyber liability almost instantly. So from there, I'm gonna hand it over to Kevin. Um, I'll flip through your slides, Kevin. Thank you, Ghani. You can go ahead and skip to the next one real quick. Sure. So we're an insurance brokerage. We place insurance needed for businesses beyond just cyber, work comp, general liability, all the, all the needs. We focus on businesses typically 10 million to 200 million in revenue. But we also do a lot of early stage startup, tech firms, life science, innovation businesses. And because we do this as a niche, as a specialty, uh, particularly in technology, this knowledge in cyber and the risk involved expands to our more standard businesses, whether you be a law firm or a manufacturing firm or so on. So go ahead, Ghani, next slide. When we talk about, uh, as Ghani mentioned, you can put all the best practices you can get in place, but you can't stop employee carelessness and you can't stop rogue employees. And so eventually there's the opportunity for a loss and insurance has a great play to help uh, protect your business against that. But they can also give us feedback on what are the drivers behind the claims that they see. And they say that if they could knock out three items, they would probably drop their claims by 80%. And those three items are as follows right now. Microsoft Remote Desk Protocol. 
that's uh, becoming a legacy uh, uh, legacy method of accessing your systems remotely that leaves uh, a number of vulnerabilities for hackers to get into. It's very easy for them to compromise. The second would be no secondary out of band confirmation of funds transfers. And in most cases, that means a verbal communication. It should be dependent upon your system. It might mean the verbal communication between the CFO and the account payable clerk. It might mean the verbal communication between your bank and your, your account payables department. But without that secondary out of band confirmation of funds transfer, uh, hackers really have a good time of doing wire transfers, socially phishing, compromising someone's credentials and sending emails that look like they're coming from the CFO or the controller or somebody in authority and, and not. They get pretty sophisticated in these attacks. If they can compromise an, an Outlook account and see into some calendars and find out that the CFO is going on vacation on, on this day, they will send an email saying, hey, I'm just about to hop on a plane right now. I need you to get this out. I won't be uh, available for the next three hours, but it's got to be done before 3 p.m. today. And it's very effective. We had another instance uh, uh, with a private equity firm that was closing on an acquisition. They had eight people on, a, on an email chain, both you know, multiple different parties from multiple different businesses. One lower level person's credentials were hacked into uh, in their email. And the hackers sat there in the background watching the conversation as it evolved over months. And at the end of that conversation, when it got at the appropriate time, they dropped off a CFO's email address, they spoofed it, and they provided wiring instructions for a one point, uh, it was $1.7 million claim. This was happened uh, pre-COVID, but it was a $1.7 million wire transfer that went out and, uh, uh, and was not recovered as a result of that. So secondary out-of-band confirmation funds transfer is, is a huge item. And then finally, lack of multi-factor authentication on email systems. It may take some education. It may take a little bit of people understanding how to utilize it efficiently, but nothing is better at stopping compromised emails, which is a, a huge base for how hackers get in, how they get further access. And lack of multi-factor authentication on email systems is probably the third uh, uh, and one of the biggest reasons that claims occur. So when you talk about insurance, uh, Ghani, we're ready for the next slide. <clears throat> People often don't, um, uh, you know, there's some questions that you can ask yourself. And, the, and one of those is, do we have an appropriate breach response plan? Some firms may not even have a breach response plan. They're actually simpler to create than you might think. And often your insurance uh, agent can help you develop a basic one or your IT management firm can help you develop a basic one. But having just a simple six bullet point step is gonna allow you to quickly respond when you have these breaches and know what you need to do. If you have a cyber insurance policy, those policies respond very quickly and they have requirements for you to, to, uh, to meet in order for the insurance company to pay out in some, in some claims instances. So is your IT manager who is going to be immediately responding to your uh, your event know what those requirements of the insurance policy are? The insurance policy has a 800 number for a 24 seven knock center with a data breach response coach. So your IT manager can call them up within 30 minutes on Friday at 2 a.m. Talk to a data breach response coach, talk to them about what they were planning to do, get some feedback and coordinate with the insurance company to get you back on your feet as quickly as possible. And the last question to really ask yourself is, do I have appropriate limits? As we're learning from COVID, business income loss is not driven as much by your building burning down these days. Fires are very rare. Cyber attacks, not so rare. So do you have business income limits that are appropriate and going to help your business in non-physical damage situations such as COVID-19, such as cyber attacks? And is your, is your limit appropriate? You can easily acquire benchmarking through your insurance agency to help determine if you have a, an adequate amount. But if you are a, a 20, 30, $40 million business, 1 million is not likely to be a sufficient quantity of, of cyber insurance coverage given everything that it takes. Guy? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that is is it, it not just covers um, and, and we've seen this before. It, it, it's not just to cover, you know, those 
those incidences that cost that amount of money, you also need to bring in, and, and I'm sure, I don't know if Kevin, you're going to be talking about this, but, you know, bringing in those forensics, you know, the forensics to kind of take a look at all that, um, the loss, the loss of clients and, and, and Kevin can go more into detail on that. So there's so much more than just, you know, the incident itself. So, so sure. um, I'll definitely, definitely let Kevin go into that. So next page, please. <clears throat> Look, that didn't pop up uh, on the items, but you're, you're, there we go. Okay. So the, uh, the insurance covers three big buckets, third party liability, first party loss and business income. Third party liability is what happens when people sue you. It, it includes notification costs. If you go down this list, you start to realize that a cyber loss is much more expensive than you might think at first. You might be required through, if, if you're accepting credit cards, your agreements may require you to overnight a forensic expert team to come in and do an al analysis. They got to take an overnight plane flight. They're going to bill you as much as a, a top law firm will. They'll bill you 1000 or $1,400 an hour to do a forensic analysis, analysis and provide that back. And it's part of your, your credit card agreement that you are going to do this. You're going to have fines and penalties. The number of legislation, the number of jurisdictions that are, are adding to their um, uh, <clears throat> adding to their privacy regulation is just growing and growing and growing. You know, European Union has their own. California just implemented one in January. Uh, Brazil's got one coming online. Japan's got got one coming online. The year just yesterday, uh, notice came out that the European Union has has uh, said that the current agreement between the US and the European Union is inadequate. So if you if you have data on European citizens here in the US, this regulation is gonna become again more onerous and more difficult to deal with it, uh, than it already is. First party loss, you are gonna, there's a lot of first direct party losses that you uh, experience. Uh, these viruses can brick your computers. That's when your, your hardware becomes inoperable as a result of the virus and you have to go out and buy new hardware. So the a ransomware attack could be more severe than you might think it is at first. And then finally, business income loss. You can have the direct business income loss, but you could also have a critical vendor. You know, a lot of us are built on a technology stack and there are a lot of critical vendors in there. And if one of those fails, if one of those is attacked and can't provide the service to you, you're, you may lose business income as a result. You may have contractual penalties or reputational harm or public relations that you have to cut, recover from for, for months. And all of this is included in an insurance policy. So the, 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 the potential for loss is much larger than people would uh, think it is. All right. Go ahead, Gotti. Okay, sure. Yeah, I guess um, uh, any, uh, Rory, have there been any questions submitted? I know we only have two minutes. Rory? Oh, wait, here they are. Hang on one second. Yeah, so I do see one. Uh, one was, uh, what percentage of breaches are paying out ransom? So the uh, I'll answer that real quick. The insurance companies are uh, have an index of all the different ransomware by, uh, software that's out there, and they know instantly whether or not it's efficient and reasonable to pay out the, the ransomware or whether or not it's not going to be helpful. In certain cases, paying the ransomware may get your data back, but you can't guarantee that your system is clean afterwards. So I, the, the latest information that I've heard is they're paying probably in the neighborhood of, of 30 to 50%, and they're doing a, a recovery on the rest of the stuff. I don't know what your actual experience is, Ghani. Is your uh, actual experience different on what uh, number of times that your clients are actually having to pay on ransomware? Um, I mean, we've very, very, very rarely, um, with, um, in, in, in our situation, we automatically require the, the, uh, the client to be on disaster recovery that replicates all their servers. What we have seen is maybe workstations that haven't been, um, uh, that, that, uh, w weren't backed up or that type of thing. And there was a, there was a situation of data loss that they had to, um, uh, go in and kind of negotiate with the hackers, that type of thing. Um, but what we're seeing outside of 
that's only because we require those policies in place to, to, you know, to be our clients. Before those policies were in place, we saw much more of them. Um, but we we were constantly brought into situations po post breaches, and 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 uh, in a lot of those situations, there's just a lot of negotiations with the hackers to try to get that to get that money back, not to get the data back. Yeah. Kevin, somebody just asked what the premiums would be. It's uh, it's going to vary dramatically based on industry and size. So these are very very broad strokes, but. Uh, companies in the in the very low millions of revenue, so let's say sub 10 million in revenue, are going to be near minimum premium. They could be as low as a thousand. They could be, uh, you know, a little bit higher towards uh, uh, 10,000. Uh, you know, if you're if you're around a million, million, two million, you're going to be a, about a thousand dollars a year. If you're, you know, you're up to 10 million, it's, it's going to again vary dramatically based on your industry. But it could be 10, it could be, uh, you know, 15, 20, possibly if you're in a high risk industry. And then once we start talking about 50 million or 100 million, it could it could go up dramatically. We do have um, a retailer, for instance, that's got 80 million in sales and theirs is only a nine thousand dollar cyber policy. So it's just going to it's going to, again, vary a lot based on your industry and your risk. Gotcha. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, with that, I do want to thank uh, Ghani and Kevin for both uh, jumping in and, and doing this presentation with us. Um, after after the fact, we'll kind of go through the attendee list, do a random generated uh, a poll. We were giving away a fifteen dollar uh, Uber Eats gift card uh, for those who attended. So if you are the winner, you'll you'll email very shortly with your gift card. But so we do appreciate you guys attending. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to reach out to to either of us. Um, we'll we'll shoot an email to all those who attended. Um, so again, we thank you for um, for joining. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.